in 1776, the year the United States declared its independence from England. England was not only the richest country in the world, it was also the freest and the most democratic. Unlike its arch rivals, Spain and France, England had a parliament that shared power with the king. It also had a tradition of freedom from arbitrary state and clerical power. It nurtured and protected a rapidly growing entrepreneurial and merchant class. And England was a leader in the radical intellectual revolution called the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment happened in the 17th and 18th centuries. It was centered in England, France, Northern Europe, and the Low Countries of Holland and Belgium. And then a little later in the New World of what would later become the United States of America. It was led by a new breed of intellectuals, philosophers like Voltaire and Rousseau in France, Thomas Hobbes, David Hume, and John Locke in England, Immanuel Kant in Germany, he was the one who coined the term enlightenment, and Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, and Alexander Hamilton in the New World of America. These radical new thinkers disagreed about many things, but were united in their rejection of feudal politics and of other worldly religions as guide to human governance. Instead, they put their confidence in human experience and in natural reason as the keys to happiness and to a just society. Central to that confidence was the progress and the example of science and technology that had taken such giant steps forward in the Renaissance and now vastly increased its power in the days of the English Enlightenment. This faith in science and technology was now reinforced by a new turn toward economic and political freedom as the only sure paths to progress and wealth. At the time of the American Revolution, Spain, Portugal, and France, for instance, despite the Enlightenment, had absolutist monarchies with no hint of freedom for any but the elite. Even more important for our subject, like all other kingdoms and empires in the rest of the world, they had feudal zero-sum economies through and through. Spanish and Portuguese explorers, for instance, were the first to reach, explore, and then colonize Central and South America. They did not send, however, large numbers of settlers to their new colonies and then carry on mutually beneficial trade, as the British did in North America, Instead, Spain and Portugal, in accordance with feudal zero-sum economics, simply robbed the colonies of their mineral wealth, most especially of their silver and gold. Like present-day oil-rich and mineral-rich countries, they thought they were wealthy with this huge influx of silver and gold, and they took little or no thought to developing industry or trade. Spain and Portugal, as well as Central and South America, have paid the price of this neglect many times over since 1776. England, on the other hand, became the center of the Industrial Revolution. In England, there was a small city called Colebrookdale, and nearby is the first iron bridge in the world over the River Severn. It was built in 1776, the same year our Declaration of Independence was signed. Well, engineers, scientists, artists, and businessmen from around the world came to Colebrookdale in the late 18th century to see how they did it. One key to their success was inventing a new and far more powerful way to get energy from fossil fuels, nature's gift from millions of eons past. Coal, for instance, had been known from ancient times, but were used only sparingly for heating and smelting metals. At Colebrookdale, they invented a new way to increase its power, converting it into coke. Coke was an enhanced form of coal made in much the same way that charcoal was made from wood. By using this new, more highly concentrated source of energy, whole new possibilities opened up and were soon exploited. Instead of only using high-priced charcoal smelted iron for special purposes like swords, armor, locks, knives, iron bolts, 
chains and pots and pans, Colebrookdale quickly became a leader in using the now much more plentiful coke-produced iron to forge wagon wheels, to make the first iron rails and iron wheels for newly invented railroads, and most important of all, to make cylinders for the newly invented steam engines. Well, one thing led to another, and again, no one can be sure what caused what. The steam engine, for instance, was invented to pump water from deep coal mines. Soon the steam engine, though, was improved and became a power source for railroad locomotives, steamships, factories, mills, and mines. And by the end of the 19th century, steam engines were being used to produce the most versatile kind of energy of all, newly invented electricity. Well, in Midland cities like Birmingham and Manchester, new innovations in weaving looms led to factory-produced cloth whose quality and price soon made England the world leader in fabric production. Other advances in pottery production, machine design, energy production, canals, factory construction and organization, firearms, sanitation, and medical services made England the world leader in industrial production and wealth. Well, supporting and accelerating these developments in science and technology, another Enlightenment philosopher, the Scotsman Adam Smith, provided the intellectual base for this industrial revolution and the accompanying leap forward from zero-sum feudal economics to modern free market capitalism. Smith wrote and published a book in 1776, The Wealth of Nations, a book that is still used today in defining and defending capitalism. Smith returned to simple principles. Capitalism, he wrote, was based on three simple ideas. Self-interest, specialization of labor, and free trade. If societies adhered to these principles, he said, an invisible hand would lead to a win-win economy rather than a zero-sum one. In other words, so long as there was freedom, free labor, free markets, and free trade, wealth for all was bound to increase. Well, to make sure there was free labor, free trade, and free markets, Smith realized that order was necessary. And this meant that government had a part, an essential part. It, the government that is, must have and enforce effective laws to protect private property to enforce contracts, to prevent crime, and protect against foreign threats. Other than that, however, for the most part, the government should stay out of private affairs and let the invisible hand do its work. Some call it laissez-faire capitalism. As capitalism and industry exploded on the world stage in the 19th century, some of Smith's optimism seemed to come true. Never in the long history of the human species had the world seen such an enormous growth in wealth and human power and prosperity, and not just for the elite, but for the 98 plus percent poor as well. Coal and iron, capitalism and the invisible hand made the 19th century a century of rapid population growth, impressive new cities, and ostentatious new wealth. The 19th century, however, also had urban poverty, worker exploitation in dangerous factories and mines, industrial pollution and bloody wars. Well, poverty, exploitation, pollution and wars were nothing new. For thousands of years, 98 plus percent of the people who lived in low energy agricultural societies had always and everywhere lived with poverty, disease, slavery, pollution, and wars. As Thomas Hobbes, a 17th century philosopher in England put it, the life of man everywhere is nasty, brutish, and short. Even the elite few who escaped poverty, the kings and queens, the bishops and nobles could not escape pollution, disease, and death. Even the wealthiest human beings, the average lifespan was still only a little more than 30 years. 
in the 19th century Industrial Revolution, however, all this changed. The sudden new increases in energy and wealth meant that many more people could now live richer lives. They could travel more, eat better, read and write, and had many more choices about what they could do with their lives. And the average lifespan increased to over 40 years. In the United States, capitalists like John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, Cornelius Vanderbilt, and J.P. Morgan founded whole new industries in oil, steel, railroads, and finance. They were often bitterly resented and called robber barons by labor leaders and intellectuals then and now. And true, they often did use aggressively harsh methods. And true, they did become obscenely wealthy. But it is also true that the workers in their refineries, steel mills, railroads, and offices were paid two or three times as well as workers in similar European industries, or even worse, on European peasant farms. And they were paid these higher wages not out of charity or management goodwill, but because the workers were two or three times as efficient as the workers in Europe in creating new wealth. And they were more efficient because of capitalist encouragement of technological change and innovation. They were in fact so much better off than European farmers and workers in the same century that people from Germany, Poland, Russia, Italy, Ireland, Scandinavia, and Eastern Europe immigrated to America in record numbers. And those immigrants are the great-great-grandparents of most people in the United States and in Canada today. In the middle of the 19th century, a German intellectual named Karl Marx wrote a powerful critique of this new industrial capitalist world called Das Kapital. Instead of the invisible hand promoting the welfare of all, Marx claimed it promoted only the welfare and wealth of the capitalists, the owners of industry, the bourgeoisie. It left the workers, he called them the proletariat, as wage slaves. They would, he claimed, inevitably sink deeper and deeper into poverty until they revolted and took power for themselves. They would then establish true socialist utopias where the means of production were owned by the workers themselves and production was not for profit but for the welfare of all. Along with his English colleague, Frederick Engels, Marx wrote in the most important pamphlet ever printed, the Communist Manifesto of 1848. The Communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Let the ruling classes tremble at a Communist revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Proletarians of all countries, unite. Well, that sounded like a good idea to many people in Western and non-Western countries. But it never worked out as Marx and Engels predicted. For one thing, their prediction that workers would sink deeper and deeper into poverty turned out to be mistaken. Due to the dynamics of capitalism itself, along with the struggles of many free trade union activists in Western countries, instead of sinking deeper and deeper into poverty, workers became richer and richer, in fact became middle class bourgeoisie. At the same time workers were getting richer, industrialized countries were also slowly and haltingly becoming more democratic. Free trade, free labor, and free markets seemed to be a good fit with freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and free elections as they began to develop in the democratic states of Western Europe and North America. In the 19th century, not without extreme violence, especially in the American Civil War, this partnership of capitalism and democracy did lead to the final extermination of serfdom and slavery in the Western world. In the 20th century, however, in the wake of World War I, 
a revolution in Russia did lead to the first communist state, the Soviet Union. And then after World War II, communist parties in China, in Korea, in Vietnam, and in Cuba took power. All these intellectually led parties took power in the name of the workers and the peasants, and all ended up as the most unproductive, oppressive, and totalitarian regimes in the long history of the human race. Instead of welfare for all, all of these 20th century experiments with communism led to stagnation, boredom, drastic declines in living standards, and savage gulags where 50 to 100 million people were enslaved or murdered. By the end of the 20th century, only a very few communist states still survived to carry on the cause. Cuba and North Korea are probably the only true believers. The Soviet Union is no more. All the former communist states of Eastern Europe are now free, democratic, and capitalist. China, like Vietnam, is still not free or democratic, but it is strongly capitalist in its economy and is rapidly recovering from decades of economic decay under communism. Whether it will gradually become more democratic, more free, and more respectful of human rights remains to be seen. Despite this seeming triumph of capitalism on the world stage, there is strong opposition to it in many parts of the world, including the Western world where it originated. You see, one of the major problems of capitalism is that it does not automatically bring to mind romantically utopian hopes and dreams. To many sensitive and intelligent people, it smacks of crudity, selfishness, greed, and a ruthless competition that rewards the bully and punishes the weak. And it fosters, some claim, an environmentally and morally destructive hedonism and consumer-driven excess. Socialism, in theory, gets a better press. In practice, however, full-blown socialist societies like the Soviet Union, China, Cambodia, Cuba, and North Korea have not only been the most brutal and ruthless tyrants, they have also been the world's worst polluters. Many capitalist countries in Europe, and especially in Scandinavia, have experimented with a modified version of capitalism that emphasizes strong government interference in distributing the accumulating wealth of a capitalist economy via an expanded welfare state. In fact, most Western democracies, including the United States and Canada, do not rely totally on an invisible hand to distribute wealth equally. Social security systems, national health systems, unemployment insurance, and so forth are common throughout Europe, North America, and Japan. All of these liberal democratic states today, however, do rely on the private ownership of productive industries to produce the wealth that democratic governments help distribute, modifying and softening some of the inequities and harshness of the invisible hand. Some countries of South America, notably Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador, are now flirting with more radical socialist ideas like government ownership of key industries in the hopes that they can make faster progress in overcoming poverty. Well, the invisible hand of Adam Smith seems to work well in increasing a society's wealth, but it also seems to make serious mistakes that have in the past led to booms and crashes that have caused great suffering for many hardworking people. It also means that individual companies and sometimes entire industries are destroyed in the competition for efficiency and innovation. Some analysts call this, quote, creative destruction, but that does not make it any more pleasant for those whose jobs or companies are destroyed. There is also deepening concern in the 21st century about non-economic goods like the environment and human rights. How does capitalism, with its unprecedented power of wealth creation and creative destruction, deal with non-economic goods like clean air, clear water, and productive soil? How does it deal with racial, sexual, religious, and gender discrimination? 
In all of these issues, religion and the arts come into play as well as capitalism and science. Private organizations, both secular and religious, and a free press have acted as powerful and effective restraints to correct problems brought on by capitalist excess. Well, finally, what about globalization? As modern liberal and capitalist democracy becomes ever more powerful and ever more common around the world, some activists in both the Western world and the underdeveloped world claim that its aggressive and rapid spread around the world, called globalization, harms both worlds by letting giant multinational corporations profit generously while doing little or nothing about poverty in the underdeveloped world. Instead, they claim globalization results in frivolous and environmentally harmful wealth in the Western world. This charge, say most economists and scientists who have studied poverty and wealth, is simply false. Globalization does lead to change, as capitalism always has. These scientists point to statistics that show enormous overall gains, however, in countries like India, China, Korea, Taiwan, Malaysia, and South Africa. Many of these countries were written off as hopeless just a few decades ago. And despite claims to the contrary, there have also been solid gains in income, agriculture, health, life expectancy, pollution control, and almost every other measure of progress in countries that were formerly communist in Eastern Europe, as well as in countries in South America, Central America, Africa, and Southeast Asia. Some countries, it is true, seem to have been left out of this progress so far. Many of these are Muslim oil-rich but industrial, ideologically poor countries in the Middle East. Misleadingly rich, like feudal Spain and Portugal were with their gold and silver, but handicapped by religious and ethnic differences inherited from a thousand years ago. Some of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa are also slow to progress, handicapped by corrupt governments and endemic health and environmental problems. And finally, the few still communist countries like Cuba and North Korea handicapped by a perverse and tyrannical economic and political system. If capitalism is rapidly expanding its reach around the world, what about freedom and democracy? And is there a natural partnership between free market capitalism and liberal democracy? Well, here is a map of the world in 1800 at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and the beginnings of modern capitalism. Countries in red were relatively free, democratic, and capitalist. All other countries in the world were authoritarian, feudal states, or they were still in hunter-gathering tribal societies. Well, here is the same map in 1900. Note that capitalist and democratic countries are significantly more common. And here is the same map in the 21st century. Capitalism and democracy are not only more common, they are the norm. Worthy of note is that many smaller countries in Asia and Africa are capitalist, but they're not democratic. And the same is true of China and Russia. Of special note, there are no countries that are free and democratic, but not capitalist. Scandinavian countries like Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Denmark are sometimes listed as exceptions because of their strong commitment to social welfare policies. However, their basic economy is firmly capitalist as most of the productive sphere that creates and underlies their wealth is privately owned. Some today would claim that Venezuela is an exception as well. While still relatively free and democratic, under the leadership of Hugo Chavez, it seems to be moving rapidly in the direction of communism and in the process restricting important freedoms like freedom of the press, abrogation of private contracts, 
and severe restrictions on private property. Chavez has openly boasted of his admiration and desire to follow in the footsteps of Fidel Castro's Cuba. Considering Cuba's lack of freedom and abundance of poverty, if Chavez carries through on his plans, it may well be a dark day for his country. In conclusion, we can answer the question posed at the beginning of this program with some confidence. Yes, capitalism is necessary for democracy, but it is not sufficient. A healthy regard for self-interest, for private property, and for free trade, in other words, combined with a commitment to science and technology, and leavened by a commitment to humanistic religious values, seems to be the story of past economic success, as well as human prosperity and freedom. It may or may not be the end of history, but it does seem to be the wave of the future. Thank <laughs> you.